Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Um, and thank you for all the feedback and comments. Uh, we appreciate them. Please keep sending them in, and we will try our best to respond when, as soon as possible. But uh, thank you for listening, as always. Uh, we've had a, a good string of luck lately in that we've been able to consistently bring you wonderful interviews with some um, amazing guests. And I think that streak continues today, Zucky. Yeah, so we're we're joined uh, for this installment by Abdul El Sayed, Doctor Abdul El Sayed, who's an American physician, epidemiologist, public health advocate, and politician. He's a uh, former health director for the state of Michigan, and he's currently running for the Democratic nomination for uh, governor of Michigan, which would make him the first Muslim governor in the history of this great country. So, kind of a big deal. Thank you, uh, Doctor El Sayed, for joining us. Thank you for having me, and I'm honored to uh, to be with you guys today. Well, just to start things off, uh, uh, I, uh, we we definitely want to get to your your candidacy and your desire to run and where that came from. But I think your your backstory, even before you decided uh, to pursue uh, Michigan's highest office, is fascinating in and of itself. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I was uh, the, the, the child of um, two Egyptian immigrants who. Um, uh, came through in the, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I grew up uh, in a mixed household. My parents got divorced and, uh, and both remarried. And so I grew up in a, um, a half uh, Egyptian, half white, and 100% American household uh, here in Metro Detroit. And, um, you know, uh, proud to have grown up in a family that was as diverse as mine was. My uh, mother uh, converted to Islam and, and married my father. My stepmother converted to Islam and married my father. Um, and so, you know, our, our family included people from uh, from Alexandria, Egypt, and um, and people who had uh, had been in in this territory since before uh, the Revolutionary War. And um, and so, uh, that's my ethnic um, background. I uh, grew up uh, knowing that I loved two things more than anything else. Uh, there were people and science. Huh. Um, and I, I knew I loved people because I just had the opportunity to be exposed to so many different kinds of people growing up. Uh, whether it was, uh, you know, my, my, my father's family back home in Alexandria or uh, my um, stepmother's family uh, in places like Gratiot County, Michigan. Um, the, the exposure to, to so many different kinds of people helped me to appreciate what the sort of least common denominator on humanity was and, um, and realize that I really enjoyed uh, understanding who they were and how they came to their lives, both the challenges that they faced and the hopes and aspirations that, that help them to believe in the tomorrow that's better than there today. And I also knew I loved science. Um, my, my, my family, uh, both of my parents were engineers, and so science was simply lingua franca in our house. And so I thought I wanted to be a doctor um, so I could use science to help people. And uh, as I started to learn more about, um, about medicine, I realized that, um, that if you really want to understand the patterns of health and disease, it usually has a lot more to do with a, a basic set of access to a basic set of resources, things like uh, reliable jobs, a living wage, um, access to uh, good, clean drinking water and, and air to breathe, um, good, healthy food, uh, an environment that you can walk around in that you're not going to be traumatized by. Um, and these are the things that ultimately shape who gets sick and who doesn't. And so uh, my career started to veer toward public health. I had the opportunity to, uh, to do my undergraduate at Michigan um, uh, where I studied biology and politics and then um, uh, had the opportunity to travel to Oxford uh, to do a PhD in public health as a Rhodes Scholar and then uh, finished medical school at Columbia University in New York um, uh, where I made the hard decision to not pursue a clinical residency but instead to follow my passions into public health, which ultimately landed me um, in a role rebuilding the Detroit Health Department. So uh, can you talk about your experience uh, in, in, in that capacity? Uh, what, what were the, some of the challenges that you faced, and um, uh, how, did, how did you work your way through them? Yeah, so I walked into a, a health department that had been privatized when the city was facing municipal bankruptcy and state emergency management takeover. And, um, and so the, the, the mayor, who had been elected in 2014, wanted to rebuild that department, and he hired me to do it. Um, and so I walked into a five-employee, 85-contractor uh, department that was in the back of the municipal parking building. Um, on my first day at work, actually, a gentleman, he, um, he walked up to me and asked if I worked there. And you've got to imagine my first day at work. I know that I'm, 
Um, I'm young for the job, and I, you know, I've never done this job before. I'm trying to look as professional as I can. And the guy walks up to me and he's like, hey, you work here? I said, yeah, I do. He said, uh, okay, cool. Can you take my ticket for me? And I was like, I don't, I don't, um, he's like municipal parking. I'm here to pay my ticket. Huh. I was like, no, 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 I work for the health department. He looks at me and he's like, I think, I think you're lost, son. Um, and, uh, and I took his ticket anyway. Um, but, uh, we, we rebuilt that department, um, basically from the ground up. And, um, in my first couple of weeks of work, I had the opportunity to meet a, a little boy who, who really helped me to understand exactly what it was that our department could do. And, um, and this was a three-year-old little boy who was the fourth child of a 21-year-old mom. He probably met his father maybe four times in his life. Um, and, um, and when his mom introduced him to me, uh, you know, he didn't do the thing that most kids do, which is hide behind his mom or, uh, you know, give me the sort of side eye and, and, and huh. barely put his hand up. He came up right to me and gave me a big hug. And, um, you know, the confidence of this kid was astounding in the face of the kind of statistics that he faces. Because in Detroit, the mortality rate is higher than a kid's likelihood of being hospitalized for asthma is literally triple what it is in the rest of the state. And uh, right. one in 10 kids are going to be exposed to lead, which compares to uh, literally a quarter that much um, in the rest of, of the country. And so we got to work rebuilding our department around the goal of, of, of using health to interrupt intergenerational poverty, which meant um, we were doing things that focused on making sure that, uh, that health was not going to impede a kid's ability to learn and earn like mm -hmm. we would want for any of our kids um, anywhere, uh, Detroit or, or anywhere else. And so we did things like build programs to give kids access to glasses free of charge delivered at school um, so that, um, you know, at least even if they're sitting in decrepit school buildings that were overcrowded, that they could see the blackboard. Um, when, uh, when some of the bigger corporate polluters in our state wanted to increase their emissions of harmful uh, chemicals like, like sulfur dioxide, which is a known carcinogen and, um, and a cause of asthma exacerbation, we stood up to them and said, you can't do that here because... These, uh, these, these emissions are going to go right into our kids' lungs. And it's one of the reasons that our asthma hospitalization rate is triple what it is in, in other uh, contexts. And so um, we forced, in the case of Marathon Petroleum, we forced them to invest $10 million to clean up their act overall um, and reduce their emissions of sulfur dioxide rather than increase it. And then, um, you know, many people have heard of the Flint water crisis, which rocked yeah, our state uh, a couple absolutely. years ago. And um, we realized that given the state of Detroit public schools, um, that uh, many of our kids could be exposed to lead um, at school, which is the place that we willingly concentrate our most vulnerable people most of the day, most of the year. So uh, we realized that, um, that we, we should probably have our schools tested. We created a protocol in three weeks um, to have every single school daycare and Head Start tested for lead in the water. There's 360 schools, and we carried that out in six months. Um, and that, that protocol is now model practice for the National Association of City and County Health Officials. Uh, we also built a program to train women across our community to be what we call sister friends, um, mentors for uh, women who are pregnant um, to, to try and give them access to somebody who knows the lay of the land when it comes to resources mm -hmm. and who can be an objective, honest um, mentor for them uh, as they face this challenge of pregnancy, many uh, of them without a reliable partner. Um, and, and then we also did work to, to provide access to preconception family planning uh, services in discrete locations that weren't going to be stigmatized, like rec centers. Um, given that we know that um, basically one in six babies born in the city is going to be born to a teen mom, and if a if a woman who is a teenager uh, has an unwanted pregnancy, her likelihood of dropping out of school is 50 percent, um, and um, and her fertility goes up an entire extra child, um, which doesn't bode well for any of the children she has because she, you know, given the fact that she hasn't finished high school, um, is going to find herself. In, in far harder circumstances around trying to provide for those children. So we really tried to think about how do we map the, the experience of a young child and how do we optimize um, around the health experiences that either shape the circumstances of, of their lives um, or um, uh, stand in the way of them being able to learn and earn as we would want for any of our kids uh, anywhere. So uh, that's the work that we did. And ultimately for me, you know, the reason I'm running for office now uh, it's just because the, the, the situation of being uh, in a position to rebuild an agency that was shut down uh, by emergency managers when the city of Detroit uh, went bankrupt, and then watching it, the same emergency managers were poisoning the same kinds of kids I was trying to protect in Detroit and Flint, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a bit of a wake-up call. And um, I realized that uh, if, in fact, public health is really about all of those other things that create the circumstances of health, um, my ability to actually uh, accomplish my end 
as a health commissioner was actually quite limited. Um, and, um, and decisions about uh, how we provide access to scarce resources in communities more equitably, more sustainably, and more justly uh, really were the places that we needed leadership. And um, you know, like many of you, um, uh, the, the conversation leading up to the 2016 election uh, brought us both a tone, a tenor, and a sense of content that um, we haven't really heard in the past yeah. about mm-hmm. who could and could not be American, about uh, okay. what it really meant to be a society that um, that is equitable and inclusive. And uh, I realized that, um, you know, as a, as a physician, um, as an educator, as a public servant in my state, uh, had a series of challenges that I thought I was uniquely situated to be able to address. And also just the fact of being um, a millennial a Muslim um, and, uh, and, and, and Egyptian American, um, I felt like there was a responsibility to, to stand up um, to be able to articulate both that there is a way forward that puts people at the front of government and also a way forward that allows any and all of us to aspire to that greatest end of leadership or citizenship, which is to potentially lead in a democratic society. So I decided to run for governor. Wow, um, that's and it's an amazing story. And and you know when 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 Zucky was kind of reading off your um, you know background at the beginning, I mean it was like kind of it was it reminded me of that game of like one of these things is not like the other. And it was like the word politician just kind of stuck out because you have this amazing <laughs> background in public health and and in, you know and and I'm certainly as a physician, um, but I think like you just I think you very arti- you know in a very articulate manner kind of. Uh, made a case for why you felt that you wanted to go into the political arena. Um, the uh, The health commissioner position was an appointed one, or yeah, it like, was were you appointed by the government? By the mayor. What about the uh, mayor? The mayor. Know. Okay, got yeah. it. Right. 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 Um, so, I'll tell you, uh, Rudolf Virchow. I don't know if uh, you or your listeners have heard of him, but he's a really famous uh, um, early twentieth uh, century physician out of Austria, and. Um, he is somebody who started his career out as a doctor and then, and then went into politics, and he's somebody I look a lot up to. Um, and he said uh, something that I think is really important to, to think about, which really hits at that notion of um, what it means to, to actually protect health. He said that the, the, the physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor and that social problems should be largely solved by them. And um, you know, that always stuck, uh, stuck out to me um, as a very prescient quote about you know, ultimately, anybody who practices medicine in the United States will tell you um, that the way that we structure in our society is such that uh, hospitals and doctors become, in a lot of ways, um, uh, arbiters of social pathology, right? Not necessarily just the physical pathology or, or mental pathology that they treat, but also a social pathology about how we deal with poverty in a society that tells us that poverty is, is uh, the responsibility of those who are poor, rather than the responsibility of the way that we have set up society to allow uh, certain people access to things and certain other people uh, to go without them. Um, and so, I, I, you know, the, the, the transition, I know, sounds weird, but uh, the values that I've always believed in, um, I think, have called me to, to, to moving into this role where, uh, where I hope I, I have the opportunity to do something about exactly that system of patterning um, access to, to scarce resources that are so critical to have the kind of dignified life that we would want for everybody in the society. No, I mean, I, I don't think it's weird at all. And in fact, I mean, to be honest with you, it's it's quite not only a very compelling story, but just, uh, a, you know, a commendable one. I mean, you know, you could be, you know, enjoying the luxuries of private practice and, and, and you know, and living in southeast Michigan, but rather you decided to roll up your sleeves and, and, and really do something about um, the, like you said, some of the sort of real systemic uh, issues um, that have plagued the state uh, and, and, and southeast Michigan in particular for a long time. Um, so I guess tell us maybe I guess a little bit about um, what what drew you to run um, I, I guess within the Democratic primary as opposed to Republican. I mean, was it just sort of what what was it within the party that, that sort of compelled you to um, move in that direction? Well, I've always you know I've always been a a believer that the the thing that we should be building to is a more just, a more equitable, more verdant, and a more sustainable world and. Um, you know, my values are uh, are pretty. I, I would I would argue are uh, rather progressive and have always been. You know, before um, uh, before it, it became a you know a hot word to say the word progressive. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, and I believe that the, the responsibility of government is to create the means of equitable opportunity for everyone. Um, you know, ultimately, I think what separates Democrats and Republicans, particularly 
is about who one attributes success to, uh, and therefore also who, who one attributes um, quote unquote failure to. And, um, and the, 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 the Republican worldview is founded on the idea that the only agency is, is individual agency. That um, when something happens good for someone, it's because somebody rolled up their sleeves and did the hard work. Um, yeah. and, um, and when something, something doesn't go well, it's because people are failing to do the hard work. And I find that to be a, a really um, disingenuous way of looking at the world. Um, uh, because to me, I, I know, um, I, I can see exactly what, uh, society has given me. All I have to do is compare my life to the life of my cousins uh, in Egypt who are just as smart and just as capable and just as charismatic and just as articulate, but didn't have the means of a fantastic education and a, and a meritocracy um, that allowed them to succeed and thrive in the way that I've been able to. Now, does that mean I didn't work hard for a lot of the things that I, um, I've, I've been able to achieve? No, of course I did. But, uh, but the point is, is that I had the circumstances to be able to work hard in. Um, and I think society uh, creates those circumstances. And if you fail to see it, it's because you're you're not paying attention to the uh, to the to the uh, context. And um, and so right. you know, I watch as our society becomes more unequal, um, as the fruits of labor uh, get segregated further and further to the top. Um, and I ask whether or not the means of that kind of success that I was able to enjoy uh, will be available to generations after me. And I don't know that those that's actually true. And so. Um, I'm running as a progressive and as a Democrat because uh, of my worldview and because I believe that ultimately um, we have a responsibility to sustain the kind of society that provides opportunities and also separates uh, church and state, right? Well, I get to worship the way I choose to worship because nobody in this uh, government can tell me not to, per the Constitution. Um, unfortunately, I think um, many Republicans would argue that it's perfectly fine uh, to read one's own um, uh, faith positions into the Constitution, and I reject that summarily. So, um, so for for so many reasons, I'm running um, as a progressive uh, for the Democratic nomination. And then, lastly, let's be honest: Donald Trump is president right now. And um, if you just look at the the kind of uh, quote unquote American carnage that he has wrought uh, in his first 100 days um, uh, as president, um, there is a responsibility, I think, for anybody who believes in the value of our democracy and uh, all of that it, it idealizes to. Uh, to stand up and resist, and I hope to be a part of that. Wonderful. I, I was um, wondering if you could you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective as a physician, um, if you could talk about what's going on right now, literally right now, where the House of Representatives is uh, trying to figure out a way to unwind uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, do you, a do you, do you think uh, their efforts will bear fruit? And um, B, as, as a physician, uh, what do you see as the potential uh, outgrowth of, of uh, what they're trying to do? Yeah, look, in, in my state alone, 2 million people stand to lose their health care. Um, and uh, and um, what's, what's ironic about this is that the ACA started out as a, as a conservative idea. You know, it was first passed in Massachusetts as Romney Care and um, passed by the, the, the 2012 uh, nominee for the, the Republican uh, ticket for president. And, um, and since it was passed by Obama, right, now it's all of a sudden become this liberal idea. And, uh, you know, if, if it is, if it, if it is um, unraveled, it will hurt many, many people. It will hurt um, uh, a number of hospitals, but it will benefit other corporations that have, you know, invested in, uh, in seeing its demise. And, um, and that is a loss for humanity. So um, I, you know, I, I, my position on this is that uh, we need in this country to come to the facts, and the facts are that every other high-income society has some form of deep government engagement in healthcare. Simply because healthcare is a broken market, um, people are not um, symmetrical or rational consumers of healthcare in the way that they are of like shoes or cars. Mm. So you shouldn't treat them the same way. Um, and um, uh, and in those countries like the UK or Canada, which have very different healthcare systems but both have uh, really strong government engagement, their health care costs uh, are about half as high as ours per, uh, per person. They, um, they uh, are able to provide very equitable access to care. Um, that's really high standards. So uh, I think we got to get with the times. Um, we have this sort of stubborn uh, belief in the market for all things, and you know, ultimately that goes back to uh, the, the lobby of a very, very powerful set of corporations who stand to lose a lot if we um, if we uh, bend 
healthcare so that it helps people instead of them. Um, and that's why we see this very incoherent conversation right now. Um, so I do hope that, uh, that this, this too uh, shall pass and fail. Um, mm-hmm. But I worry about um, the stubborn uh, approach that uh, Republicans are taking to you know, dismantling a system that has ultimately provided uh, many millions of people in our country with access to care that they hadn't had for a very long time. Mm. Um, so, I, I mean, I was wondering if you could transition from that uh, to kind of talk uh, specifically about um, the the uh, upcoming election and, and sort of your campaign. When did you launch your campaign? Well, I, I guess when is the primary kind of give listeners, I guess, certainly yeah. outside of Michigan, but even our listeners in Michigan, kind of an idea of what of what the roadmap looks like ahead. Absolutely. So um, I launched my campaign on February 24th. We did it at the Eastern Market, which is where my um, my dad uh, first uh, moved, where my dad first moved when he uh, came over from Egypt. And it's a place that uh, my family and I um, have, you know, sort of seen as a touchstone for uh, us in, in, um, and our, our, our families. So it was really meaningful for us to launch there. Um, yeah. and, um, and we've been at it for now for two months. We just finished a, a statewide listening tour that took us to 25 different counties 48 different cities. And, um, and our job, uh, first and foremost, is to win the, the, the Democratic primary, uh, which uh, will take place in August of 2018. And then um, we got a three-month slog to the general. Um, our approach really is to be having a coherent conversation with everybody in our state about the challenges that we face and about the responsibility for our state to be able to come together around its problems, right? I, I think nothing unites diverse people uh, more than a sense of a shared future and a need to work together uh, to save it. And um, and I think it's become very clear for us exactly how much hangs in the balance. And so uh, my hope is that our candidacy can be something that uh, unites people rather than divides us um, and allows us to have a conversation that I think is sorely missing right now. Um, I, always, I often say that I think the two most powerful uh, words in the English language are I disagree. And the reason they're so powerful <laughs> is because they imply that you're actually having a conversation in the first place. Um, and that you trust the other person enough to air the fact that you don't agree with them and that you are willing to engage on the premises of that disagreement. And, um, mm. and my hope is that you know, right now we have been sucked into a system, or lack thereof, uh, of conversation that tells us that we cannot see across demographic differences, that the only, uh, the only truth is the one that exists in your own mind, and that, um, that the other side is, uh, you name it. Um, you know, you hear it on either side. They're deluded or they're crazy or they're stupid or they're whatever. And the reality is that people, uh, all of us have a position. We all have an opinion and we're all entitled to our opinion. We're not entitled to our own facts, unfortunately. And we're also not truly entitled if we, if we hope to have a real conversation about problems. We're not entitled to be able to shut down conversations because we disagree with somebody. And the thing, single, I think the single most important piece of resistance we can have right now is the courage and the will to have a conversation across um, across uh, uh, demographic divides that tell us um, that the other is X, Y, or Z, right? The courage to actually smile and engage and say, even if the only thing we agree on is that I love my mom and you love your mom, well, then that's a point of agreement and we should celebrate that, right? <laughs> um, but the this, this, this system of fear works because it tells us that we cannot see one another's humanity and that we cannot have a conversation. So what we're doing is, is um, opposing that. We are going everywhere and we hope to talk to everyone. And, you know, as a 32-year-old brown Muslim guy, um, that sounds kind of crazy, but it's what we have to do. And, you know, in a lot of the rooms that I've walked into, um, I was probably the only person of color there. Many of the folks in that room may not have ever met a Muslim, but I don't really quite care because there's a conversation we need to have about our future. And I worry a lot about um, that future uh, for my kids, just like those people worry about that future for theirs. And so let's have a conversation about what we can do together to build the kind of future that we will be proud to hand off to, to those children. And, um, and normally when you meet somebody there at that premise, they're a lot more likely to, um, to be willing to sit down and have a conversation. And, um, and that's what we've seen in room after room after room. And, um, and I think those conversations have been very gratifying. They've been very helpful for us in terms of understanding what it is that Michiganders are worried about and what it is that we can do about it. And, um, and we recently released a platform that, um, that I think articulates a bold progressive vision for our state that's founded in uh, conversations that we've had about uh, our democracy, about our environment, about our economy, about our uh, public school system, about health care, um, that are things that people really want to have conversations about because the future looks kind of scary, particularly with um, the, the individual in the White House 
uh, who occupies it now. Hmm. Yeah. It, you know, and speaking of the individual who occupies the, the Oval Office and the White House, um, you know, much has been said and much uh, sort of, you know, in terms of uh, retrospective armchair quarter, you know, armchair analysis in terms of what took place in, in the election. Uh, and, and certainly the Rust Belt and, you know, I, I would even say Michigan included, um, you know, what was was a part of that conversation and in, in, in terms of what happened and, and how the election went the way it did. Um, I, I think your candidacy, candidacy in, in, in many ways kind of flies in the face of uh, at least some of the analysis that came out early on, which was that this was purely based on, you know, race and, and, and they voted. Um, you know, it was it was it was white. It was the you know white population of those states who voted for Trump. And it was. You know, and, and so I think your candidacy and what it represents kind of really, I, I think you, I think you, in a certain way, kind of question the the analysis of that, right? And that, and that, like you said, it, it's about people from different demographics who can come together on issues that are of concern to them. Um, and so I think, you know, as, as someone running across the state in Michigan, I mean, how do you, how, how do you, how has it gone so far in terms of like, like you said, being the only brown Brown Muslim in the room, perhaps, or or meeting, having you know, meet, having met people who've never come across a Muslim, at least knowledgeably. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. Um, Knowingly, sorry. I, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, uh, I I I'll just give you an analogy, right? Let's say there was a gentleman, um, perfectly uh, average, um, aside from the fact that that gentleman has blue hair, right? And I tried to I asked him, tell me about this individual. What do you think is the first thing you would say about them? Guy has he blue has hair, blue hair. Right? right? Because it's the thing that's the most uncommon, right? Right. Now, um, the thing about Donald Trump is that he was not a, he was not a highly common uh, candidate. But the thing that made him most uncommon was the fact that he said things that um, previously had not been said um, uh, because they were so uh, inappropriate and wrong and hateful, right? And so everybody thinks that the reason he won is because he said those things. And truly, I just don't think that's the case. I think for some small portion of the electorate, sure, um, he spoke to a sense of uh, a sense of xenophobia or a sense of you know political maladroitness that um, uh, that feels good right now because people are frustrated. But they're not frustrated because people are racist. They're frustrated because, from frankly, if you look at the proportion of the population that think he did well. Uh, there has been a true and real decline um, in, um, in you name it, um, uh, any sort of metric of well-being you can talk about, uh, whether it's employment, whether it's wages, whether it's life expectancy, right? The only group with, for whom life expectancy has dropped over the past several years um, is uh, lower middle income white men over the age of 40, right? So, so there is a sense of, of pain that, um, that frankly, uh, the, the Democrats just missed. Everybody mm-hmm. attributes it to some sense of racism among people. I just don't think that's the case. I've got a I've got a family member who voted for Donald Trump, and he is not a racist guy. This guy, um, he started driving truck after after he uh, graduated from uh, high school and built himself a nice little trucking business. And in 2008, when the economy went bust, um, so did his, his trucking business. It really took a hit. Um, thankfully, he was able to uh, get away, and and and, um, and he's doing just fine. But um, but his life experience is fundamentally different than. Um, than the one to which Hillary Clinton seemed to be speaking. And she was not talking about experiences for people like him. And Donald Trump was. And so we attribute Donald Trump's win, I think, to the most, the most, the craziest thing about him, uh, which is the, the hate speech, frankly, that, um, that he spewed out throughout his run. But I actually think it's because he was talking to a demographic that everyone else was simply missing. And, um, and, you know, the other person who spoke to that demographic was Bernie Sanders, and he did pretty well. He won the uh, the, the Democratic primary in Michigan. So I firmly believe that the people in my state are good people. They, um, this, this race stuff, um, it's, it's, if it's even present, it's hugely tertiary quaternary. Um, but what is on the top of people's minds is who is going to fix the economy so that my life gets better. And, um, and this is, this is the big question here today, right? Is, you know, the question of the 21st century is what are we going to do, um, to build an economic system after automation and offshoring, uh, and in particular automation, uh, make labor a, a very different thing than it used to be, right? Um, right. When, 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 almost, when many jobs can be done better by, by a machine, what happens, what becomes of the traditional labor market? Um, and this is a conversation that you know, has to be had at the leading edge in places like Michigan and elsewhere. 
So I'm betting my um, the next year and a half of my life and, um, and my candidacy on the fact that Michiganders want to talk about jobs, they want to talk about public schools, they want to talk about their environment, um, and they're not le- a lot less interested in talking about race. Um, and if we're willing to have a conversation with everyone, whether they're poor and working black people in Detroit or poor, poor and working white people in places like Ishpeming or Big Rapids, um, I think we can be successful because we're talking about the issues that manifest uh, in people's real lives. <sighs> Uh, with, with that in mind, I mean, w- when discussing uh, sort of the optics of your candidacy, um, you know, the, the reality is that by virtue of the fact that you are uh, the first Muslim who's who's standing for for a position like this, you know, your uh, your faith is something that's going to be uh, used by some as as a cudgel against you, or it's something that people uh, may potentially uh, view you with suspicion because of. Um, how do you? plan to to tackle that in terms of this sort of uh, the the elephant in the room if you will um you know as as something that that will potentially be uh, be deployed against you by 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 people with with the you know less than idealistic intent um how do you how how do you plan to respond mm-hmm. to that i'm muslim <laughs> all right let's talk about problems um it's a good answer you know, I, honestly like i, I I just, yeah, so I am Muslim. I'm not running away from that. I, my name is Abdul. My whole name is Abdurrahman. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I have a beard and um, I'm brown and, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I practice my face devoutly. My wife wears a hijab. Okay. All right. Cool. So, so let's, that, now that we've said it, let's put it to the side and let's talk about challenges that we face uh, in, uh, in Michigan, right? I mean, like, I, I, I'm, the, the, the candidacy is not founded on being Muslim. The candidacy is founded on um, being able to, to, to uniquely tackle problems that my state faces. So mm-hmm. just as I am Muslim and brown and 32, I am also a physician, an educator, a public servant, and a millennial. And um, I'm those things in a state where um, we have had the biggest single public health disaster uh, over the past 10 years in a state that has gone from one of the top 10 educational states in the country to bottom of the barrel, in a state uh, where uh, we sit on 21% of the world's fresh water and we can't figure out how to protect it, and in a state where we have failed to build an economy that millennials want to invest in. So, you know, I grew up in a society that told me that when you are called to serve and you have something to offer, you stand up and you serve. Um, And I'm doing that. And, you know, I don't think it should matter if I'm brown or blue or red uh, or if I'm Muslim or atheist or Hindu, um, you know, this, this, this society uh, guarantees us um, through the Constitution a separation of church and state. So what I do in my house um, and how I practice my faith has, you know, little to do with, um, with the, the kind of uh, capacities to, uh, to engage, um, even if it's an inspire, inspiration to me about how I ought to live my life in service. So, yeah. um, so I think we can move beyond that, that, that issue. Um, yeah. I'm pretty confident that after a while, right, people are a lot more interested in how you're going to make my life better than how do you pray in your own home. But I also tell you, right, people, when we talk about faith, most of the time they don't really care as much how you pray or even uh, what language you pray in. They care a lot more about what you pray for, right? And mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I pray for uh, my wife and my family and my state and my country and a more just and more verdant, more equitable, more sustainable world, which I think is the kinds of things that people pray for all over the state or hope for if they don't pray at all. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the point, sure, it might be used against me. That's fine. But, um, in, in the long, in the long scheme of things, this is not a new issue. Uh, people have carried the torch of, um, of, 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 of representing and driving for a more, um, inclusive society since the founding of our country. You know, that torch happens to, to fall on my hands. I hope that they're strong enough to carry it. Um, and someday I'll pass it off to someone else. But, um, you know, the bigger point right now is my, my state needs um, the services I hope I can offer. Um, I, I think I can do the best job at offering them. And so I'm not going to let um, the perception of other people's racism uh, or the fact that I'm brown and that's the elephant in the room um, keep me from doing the service by my state when I know my state needs it. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you make me miss the days I lived in Michigan, uh, Abdul. So um, I, I could I could I could vote for you right now if I lived in Michigan again. So um, no, I, I mean I, I, I mean I can't even, 
<laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I have, uh, and there, and I know they're listening. Uh, a lot of friends uh, down in Canton, Michigan, that would like nothing more than me to move back. So, and and and, and to be honest with you, like our daughter was born in St. Joe's and 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 our and in Ann Arbor, and so Michigan is always going to be near and dear to my heart. So, um, I think. Uh, you know, God willing, it'll be in wonderful hands, uh, not only with your candidacy, but also, you know, um, inshallah, God willing, with your election. Um, I, I just I have two I have two sort of questions and maybe we can kind of then use those to kind of wrap up the, the conversation because um, uh, I know you've got places to be as well. Um, one is, you know, how do you like I, I think one of the or, or have you heard criticisms or have you heard conversations that are happening within specifically the Muslim community and how the Muslim community is dealing with some of the, um, and I think specifically say social issues that are usually part of the progressive agenda, right. Or the progressive platform, you know, have you, have you had those conversations? How do you, how do you, you know, how do you make sense of that? I think as, as, as a Muslim running, you know, uh, as a Democrat, as someone who considers himself a progressive. Yeah, look, I, um, I believe fundamentally both the, you know, in congruence with my faith and my, uh, my, my, my country's creed, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal, right? Let's start there. And then the second point is that, um, you know, there shall be no religious test to citizenship, which implies that there's neither a religious test nor uh, a test for religion, right? Mm-hmm. And um, my, my responsibility uh, as governor of the state of Michigan when I take that oath, I will uh, swear uh, to protect and defend uh, the Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. And that Constitution firmly separates church and state. So I cannot, you know, I, I'm not going to be in, in, uh, in, in, in my position uh, responsible for, um, uh, for uh, legislating on any faith position, just like I wouldn't want anybody to legislate their faith position on me, Right. So I, I think, you know, my responsibility toward this end um, is to create the kind of space within and sustain the kind of space within anybody has the right to choose what life they want to live, um, recognizing that most of them are not going to exactly choose my life, but I'm perfectly okay with that, right? Uh, and at the same time, recognizing that that exactly is what protects my right to practice my faith in the way that I choose to practice my faith. And that, in a pluralistic society, is sacrosanct. And so... Um, you know, m- my role in this is uh, to guarantee people's rights to have a conversation about what is the best life and to be able to choose in accordance with what they find, whatever that might be, so long as they are uh, respecting the right of another to do the same. And so mm-hmm. um, I just I think I think um, we have to we have to recognize that when we're talking about civic space, there is a responsibility to, to disaggregate one's own um, uh, sense of beliefs from. Uh, what the laws of the land ought to be, right? Because um, just as we would not want anybody to tell us what we can do with respect to the fact that, you know, we choose voluntarily to put our face on the ground 34 times a day. Um, And to a lot of people, that's ridiculous. But to us, that is what we believe and how we choose to practice our faith. And so I'm not going to be in a position to rob somebody else of the right um, and the privilege to live the kind of life they choose. So um, I just think, uh, I think, we have to be thoughtful about exactly what the bounds of civic power ought to be and not be in the position where we are contradicting the, the, our own set of principles that allows us to do as we choose um, in this pluralistic society. So as we wrap things up, you know, you are, you are doing something that uh, I'm really gratified by, which is uh, you are ma- trying to trying to make uh, your way in the political world, which is something I want to see more people um, in the Muslim community doing. Uh, so potentially you could be uh, blazing a trail that uh, a lot of young Muslims may follow. In. And with that in mind, what uh, what would be your words of wisdom for them? What what advice would you offer to people who do want to follow in your trail? I'd say, uh, I'd say three things. Number one, that you have no right to anything uh, unless you are willing to work two to three times as hard as everyone else. That's just that. Um, and I hate to say it, but that's the truth of the matter. Right? You, will, you will work beyond your demographic, and you better be willing to do that. Don't, don't walk into something you haven't cased fully and are not willing to give every ounce of blood, sweat, and tears to accomplish. That's number one. Right? Mm. Um, number two, 
if you are willing to do that, you have every right to do that. Don't let the naysayers, um, naysayers put you down. You don't know how many times people will tell you you can't because, right? And um, if I listened every time somebody told me I couldn't because, I'd be in a very, very different position in my life. And um, although I'm, I'm thankful for where I am, um, but I do know that there are a lot of times where I willfully and, you know, inshallah, pleasantly ignored people who thought they knew a lot more about what I could or couldn't do, right? Um, <laughs> nice. And then number three, I would say, you know, <clears throat> smile. There is, you know, I, I had this woman in Cali who, um, when I spoke at a church in Westland, Michigan, downriver, which is an area that went really holy for Trump. It was a, uh, a, um, a, uh, 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 a Methodist church. And, um, this woman, Sally, who was in her seventies, had like the perfect head of, of these like silver curls. Um, she walked up to me and she just put her hand on my face and she said, you know, you have a really nice smile. And, um, a lot of people are going to, a lot of people are going, are going to not listen to you simply because of who you are, but you have to keep smiling. Um, because you can't hate somebody who's smiling at you. And, um, and so, you know, the willingness to do this, uh, one cannot say it's unfair, um, why, et cetera. Look, if you're going to jump into this arena, um, you're taking your, uh, your reputation and your perspective and your work ethic in your own hands. Um, and you have to be bigger than, uh, and than the hate. And, um, and so keep a smile on your face, work those two to three times, uh, as hard as, 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 as somebody else would. Um, and then, uh, you know, politely ignore the people who tell you you can't because. Um, <laughs> and then the day, Tata, you know, all success, all success, we believe, is from God. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, prayers to Khara, um, ask for guidance and whatever's best for you, and then uh, wage your path. Well, really quickly, we're, we are running out of time, but I want to make sure that everyone who's listening has the opportunity to to check out your website and donate to your campaign if needed. So can you give uh, our listeners a heads up on where they can find you online? Yeah, absolutely. I hope they will um, uh, come and get involved. So, a follow us for fa- on Facebook at um, uh, our handle is Abdul from Michigan, one word. A B like boy, D like dolphin, U L four F O R Michigan M I C H I G A N. Our website is abdulformichigan dot com, um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Abdul I'll say it no dash. Um, and I hope you'll get involved. We need uh, we need to create a movement here, and um, we cannot do it without the support of really great people who believe in what we're. Uh, we're trying to do, um, and uh, you know, um, but, uh, we'll see what comes of it. But um, it's been exciting, uh, and I do hope that um, that this work is inspiring a generation of younger people to believe that uh, there are no glass ceilings, um, and if there are, then you're just going to bust through them because uh, we are here to stay. Um, we we have every right uh, to aspire to leadership in the society, and um, and although the work is going to be hard, and blazing trails has never been easy, uh, it's work that could never be more important than it is right now. So. Um, I hope folks will get involved and with our campaign and beyond. Great. Well, uh, Abdul, thank you so much for coming on our show, and we wish you much success in the future. That's right. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank yeah, no, so it was much. a bree- short, short, breezy conversation. But, uh, you know, again, thank you for taking the time to, to, to stop by our little humble podcast and, and uh, on, on your speaking tour. So Godspeed, and we wish you the best. And, and like I said, uh, you know, we will um, hopefully our listeners can uh, support you in any way they can. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, for inviting me, and um, I do hope that uh, we get to cross paths again soon. Hopefully. Take care. Okay. And, and uh, we're out. Pervez, you want to close us out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you again, listeners, for always listening. Uh, you can uh, write us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can... Um, you can reach us on Facebook, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Um, check us out wherever you find fine podcasts and write us reviews. Give us a star rating. And uh, thank you, as always, for listening. <laughs>